appears in the title. And this is actually a center object that we will study. So I'll start with the definition of it. Okay. So the term graph fun actually is short for graph function because the model is defined by a symmetric measurable function mapping unit square to unit interval. So this is a picture of it. Uh, you know, the, the, the more dark you get, um, so it means the function value is closer to one. And then the, the lighter part means that your function value is closer to zero. This is a picture, you know, of example of a WN. And then uh, starting from this graph one, you get a random graph model in the following way that um, you sample n different labels, x1 to xn that follows ID uniform zero one distribution. And then you get your random graph in the following way that the random graph has n different vertices. And then from edge EIJ, which is um, the edge that connects vertex i to vertex j, it follows Bernoulli distribution with parameter w and x i x j. Okay. Um, so for example, um, this is a agency matrix generated from this graph on. Uh, a black dot indicates that there is an edge there. A white dot indicates that there's not an edge. And this is like a display of the random graph you get, right? So for vertices coming from this darker side, uh, they're more likely to connect to each other. Uh, whereas vertexes coming from this um, lighter side are less likely and more sparse on this side. Okay, um, so our problem, so as in the title, you know, learning sparse graph bonds. Um, so the, the main problem will be actually giving you a random graph that looks like this, how are you going to reconstruct your graph? Um, so this is um, the, main, the main question. Okay, so um, in a lot of the cases, uh, we actually consider Wn of the form rho n equals rho n times q, where this q doesn't grow with n, it's a constant function. And then rho n is called the sparsity parameter or the scale parameter that indicates how sparse your graph is. Right? For, for example, when rho n equals to one, this is referred to as a dense case or vertices have average um, degree v o of n. And then when rho n equals to small o of one, this is called the sparse case. Uh, and uh, your vertices, um, it's equivalent to your vertices having average degree small o of n, right? So what we will consider in our project is when rho n equals to big O of one over n, this is the sparsest that yeah, you can get, uh, which is um, equivalent to saying that you have um, constant average degree or constant expected degree, okay. Um, so let's look at a few examples, um, you know. So when, when your graph form is a constant function, then um, you, this is the adjacency matrix you get, then you end up getting a, a restraint graph, you know. Um, and depending on your row n, it, it will determine whether you get a sparse random uh, restraint graph or a dense restraint graph, okay. And when your graph form is piecewise constant like this, you will end up getting a stochastic block model, right? So for vertices, for example, here, that um, you know come from the green community, they're more likely to connect to each other compared to you know a red point and a green point, uh, which you know is like an area here and area here. Okay, so more generally, uh, we can have any sort of nonlinear function that you like, put it here, and then it will just uh, generate uh, a, a large class of a variety of graphs. Okay, so the motivation behind modeling graphs uh, using this graph on model. Um, so it's that we want to model large networks and compared to, you know, stochastic block models uh, that, uh, you know, the piecewise constant case that I just mentioned. Um, so that the advantage of graph on is that it's actually a good non-parametric model where the number of parameters uh, need not to be fixed or even finite. Okay, so that's uh, just a brief introduction to the, to the model. And uh, let's uh, look at the, the problem itself. So our problem is the estimation problem, and the goal is to estimating Q from a single observation of a graph GN. Um, and so, so here are some uh, relevant references. Um, this are actually a large class of references, but I just list the, a few that's relevant. So the first two bulletin point is on when rho equals to small omega of one over n, which is say, you know, vertices have diverging average degree. Uh, so we actually mainly focus on this bullet point. Uh, I will expand a, a bit on this. So this, is, this corresponds to the constant expected degree case. And then, so in 2011, uh, Biko and co-authors proposed a, a consistent as, a, you, you know, they wrote a paper and then proposed a consistent estimate for Q hat, for Q, uh, in the case that uh, when vertices have different expected degree. Uh, so different expected degree uh, means that like the local structure of vertices are different. So then you can extract some information um, from some local counts um, of the graph. 
So eventually they achieve their estimator by a subgraph count. Uh, this. this is referred to as the inhomogeneous case because uh, vertices have different uh, expected degree. Okay, so this motivates people to think, you know, what happens in the homogeneous case when vertices indeed have the same expected degree. Uh, so this is a harder case because now vertices locally look the same. Uh, so, so then some simple acyclic subgraph counts yield no information, right? So then uh, this is essentially just because, you know, say the benjamin schramm limit um, at, at every point, it's just the Gaussian Watson branching process independent of your vertex label, right? So you can't just uh, use some, um, like some, some way like in this paper, so you have to find some more global information to extract, uh, to, to reconstruct your Q, okay? So there has been uh, some work uh, in this direction, some special cases. So um, Moselle uh, in 2000 and, uh, in 2015, Moselle and co-authors, um, they solved the, uh, they considered the stochastic block model with two symmetric community case and are able to get a consistent estimator for Q. Okay. And then in 2008, um, so Abey and Center, they, uh, they deal with um, the K-symmetric community case and had, uh, I think, uh, some results on community det detection, which is, uh, you know, a step towards estimation. Okay, but you now, uh, as far as I know, so no one is able you know, in this uh, sparse regime and in the homogeneous case, uh, no one is able to you know, find a good uh, estimation of this Q hat for the most uh, general Q. Okay, so that's uh, what uh, we will be considering today. Okay, um, so before I talk about the main result, um, there's an identifiability problem that I wanna mention. So um, this identifiability problem comes when sometimes, you know, two different graph bounds can generate the same distribution of the random graph GN. Uh, this is because, so for example, if you permute uh, your reverses of your random graph or permute your communities of the stochastic block model, and then you have two different graph bounds but the same distribution for the random graph, right? So this, um, so in other words, this says that, you know, there's not really a canonical graph bound that uh, your estimation procedure can output but re rather really just the equivalent classes of graph bonds. Okay, so um, that motivates us to have this definition uh, that, uh, you know, delta two of Q and Q prime to be the regular, you know, L2 norm of Q and Q prime, but up to measure preserving maps. Uh, you know, this uh, uh, phi one and phi two are measure preserving from zero one to zero one. Okay, so with this definition in mind, uh, we can uh, state our main result. Um, so this is our main result. So um, let rho n be d over n, which is the sparsest case that I mentioned, and then let mu one, mu two, mu three um, being eigenvalues of d times q in a descending order, and then g one, g two, g three be corresponding eigenfunctions. So I have three assumptions. The first one is the homogeneous assumption that I just mentioned, and then the third and the third, the second and the third are mainly technical. You know, q being bounded and mu one being simple. Okay. So if Q satisfies these assumptions, uh, one of three, and then let R be such that magnitude of mu R is larger than square root of mu one, larger than magnitude of mu R plus one. So this is referred as the generalized casting stegum threshold as in the title. That, so I will expand on this later. Okay, so assume these holds, then there exists an estimator Q hat of GN, such that the delta two distance of Q and Q, Q hat and QR goes to zero in probability as n goes to infinity, where QR is a rank R approximation of Q. So essentially uh, the theorem just says that when n is large, then we have a good approximation of QR. Um, yeah, and um, a, a remark of this is that actually when you D is big, and so D is here, so when you D is big, uh, you, you mirror actually gets scaled up and then your square root of mu also gets scaled up, but it scales up slower than this uh, mu r. So then more eigenvalues passes the threshold, meaning that your r becomes larger. So qr becomes a better approximation of q. So, so essentially um, a corollary of the theorem says that when, when n is big and when d is big, uh, q hat is actually a good approximation of q. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how we're um, main result. And I will talk a bit about uh, the generalized uh, Kastin Stigum threshold. So, the original Kastin Stigum threshold, so why we have the name generalized? So, the original, uh, in the context of um, stochastic block model or where similar models um, reads magnitude of the second eigenvalue is larger than the square root of the first one. 
uh, which um, has been extensively studied in, in this field, uh, because, for example, uh, especially for symmetric two community case, this is actually the threshold for consistent estimation. And then this is also the threshold for weekly recovering the community. Okay. Um, and so, so we call a generalized the casting stigum threshold uh, such that, you know, the first the R eigenvalues magnitude larger than square root of mu one. Um, so so why, why do we have constraints like that? Where does this square root of mu one come from? So this has something to do with the behavior of eigenvalues of the non tracking matrix outside the box uh, that I will just uh, show, show here. Okay. So let's uh, look at the picture. So, okay, so this is this picture. So this is real line and this is uh, the imaginary part, uh, the, the real part, imaginary part. So this shows the spectrum of the non tracking matrix uh, for a network generated by a block model. So this block model or this graph on, the original graph on has eigenvalues three to one. And then, you know, from this graph on you generate your random graph, and from your random graph, you generate your number cracking matrix, right? And then this is like a plot of the spectrum of the random, of the number cracking matrix you generate. The largest um, eigenvalue of that is here. I know this dot is small, but so it's roughly three. So it's near three, where three is the uh, largest eigenvalue for you, uh, for your graph on. And then the second largest eigenvalue of the number tracking matrix is two, which is really near two, which is you know the second largest eigenvalue of your of your graph. And then the rest of um, the rest uh, of the eigenvalues has magnitude. So so the circle has radius square root of three, which is like the square root of the largest uh, eigenvalue for your graph. Okay, so like outside you have here is roughly, but then um, all of the others lies inside the circle. Um, so, uh, like the two lines here summarize this, what I said formally. So, the eigenvalue of the number cracking matrix approximates eigenvalues of uh, your of your original graph on well, um, if they satisfy that you know their magnitude is large, so they're outside the circle. But otherwise, you only know that uh, you know its magnitude is it just the lies inside the circle. Okay. So, um, in other words, so. If they lie outside, then we have a lot of information of that. If they are inside, then we don't know much about it. Okay, so um, our proof is actually a constructive proof. We propose an algorithm. So we eventually just uh, make uses of those eigenvalues that lie, lies outside of the bunk and the corresponding eigenvectors to reconstruct of the cube. Um, yeah, and the side remark is that, you know, um, so, so the spectrum of the number tracking matrix is itself a, a very, very interesting question. Uh, you know, like, like the picture shown here, it's definitely not the circle law. So, you know, it's an interesting question in its own right. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Um, so here are some uh, references and uh, thank you very much. Okay, so as uh, in the first session, we'll uh, reserve uh, applauses for uh, all speakers at the end of the session. So I'll stop the recording.